Well, good morning. Welcome. I'm lead pastor Bart Letzinger. I got a question for y'all today. Scott mentioned him in the welcome. How many of y'all have been reading, getting and reading the, the daily Advent devotionals? Now don't lie. This is church. Good. Now, if you haven't been getting those, if you haven't been getting those, if you haven't been getting a push notification on your phone or, a, or getting an email with them, that's because we don't have your information. You're either not on the app or you need to. Like Scott said, get the Connect card. Give us your email. We'll email that to you each day. Put, get, uh, get the app. Get a push notification. All of them are on there. It's been a great, great um, series. The word Advent is actually, the word Advent, it's derived from the Latin for Adventus, meaning coming or arrival. And the early church, when they talked about Advent, they were actually looking for the second coming of Christ. They were waiting for that second coming of Christ. At about the Middle Ages, it shifted, and they started focusing on the first coming and actually counting up the days till they celebrated Christ's birth. So that time between Thanksgiving and Christmas became a time of Advent, a time to, to really focus in on what matters, to prepare our hearts for this coming celebration of the birth of Christ, to really focus on what it means to be a believer and follower of him. And of course, to help you do that, we put together these these uh, daily devotions. Uh, in fact, actually, I say we, and they're really great, and I can say that because I had nothing to do with them. They're all Scott, because what we did was we actually, it was funny, we actually challenged Scott, so we're sitting around staff meeting, we challenged Scott, hey, why don't you write, because Scott's a prolific writer, he's, he's incredible, it's like he can do in a day what it would take me a week to do, I love it, I wish I could put, put words together like he does on paper. But we, to make it fun, we challenged him, hey, let, we want you to do a devotion every day and base it around a Christ, one of the Christmas carols. We then had to come up with 25 Christmas carols, spiritual Christmas carols. That sounds really easy until you get to about 12 of them. And then you realize for every away in the manger and silent night is a jingle bells and a grandma got run over by a reindeer. We challenged him to do that one. He said no. So anyway. But what was really cool, on day nine, if you're reading the devotions, on day nine of the devotion, it, that was uh, for God rest ye merry gentlemen. And Scott shared this story from his life, from a, when he's a young 20-something worship leader. Now, it's kind of weird. I will share, I know a lot of pastors, I read a lot of what other guys write, and I will many times share their stories with you. So it's not unusual for me to share a, another pastor's story or something that happened in their life. What's odd is for me to share a story from another pastor who's sitting in the front row over here. So I hope I get this right, Scott. But I love this. I loved the devotion on day nine um, of our Advent devotions. And this is an episode of Scott's life when he was a young 20-something worship leader, probably just done with seminary or still in seminary there at uh, New Orleans Baptist. Or, and uh, at his church that day, they had a guest speaker famous guest speaker. His name was J.D. Gray. J.D. Gray is the first, he, he's the former pastor at First Baptist Church of New Orleans. J.D. Gray is like the Billy Graham of Louisiana. That's who he was. He was the Billy Graham of Louisiana. Uh, the politicians knew him, the governors knew him, representatives knew him. He'd speak into their lives. He was just an amazing, amazing individual. In fact, he is the one that basically brought Christ to New Orleans. And it was his ministry. And in New Orleans, you know, New Orleans is a very difficult place with Mardi Gras and stuff. But J.D. was one. He stood up against the, the, he brought the truth against the pagan revelry of the culture. He made a difference in that hardened city. But by the time Scott met him, he said he was pretty much a former of his shadow self. Really bent old man, late 70s, when he came to speak at the church that Scott was helping lead worship at. And Scott's job was basically to bring him in, because he's going to do worship, then bring him in, make sure he got to the podium, make sure he got set down, make sure he had, he had what he needed. And Scott did all that. Got J.D. up to the pulpit. Scott writes this, he said, as he settled in the pulpit... He reached the inside of his ill-fitting suit coat and he pulled out a plaque. And he affixed the plaque to the pulpit and he quoted its content. And then he began to preach like he was 20 years old. The fire, the eloquence, the passion was astounding. Scott said, he goes, I'd never heard that level of verbosity. There's Scott using big words again on me. 
never used that level of verbosity and clarity. Scott says, I, along with the whole congregation, was spellbound as this old warrior for King Jesus lit our hearts ablaze with the gospel. He preached for an hour, and it seemed like time was suspended. The passage from which he preached was the same on the plaque that he put on the pulpit, and it said this, Sirs, we want to meet Jesus. It's from John 12, a group of Greeks had come seeking Jesus, and they ran into Philip, and they went to Philip and said, we've heard about Jesus. We want to meet him. So he went to, he went to Philip with Andrew and Andrew arranged that meeting. But I love that verse. I love the, I love the scripture because it's like, like every week, I don't know how many times I've read it. You, I see something new or somebody brings something new. Think about that verse for a minute. Sir, we want to meet Jesus. This was JD's life verse. Scott writes, the passage had driven this saint of God for decades of his preaching ministry, and his desire was those who heard his voice, those who graced his presence, those whose hearts were stirred by his preaching, that they would meet Jesus. And meet Jesus that fine day we did, not in a pressing of the divine flesh way, but in the reality of the risen Savior, alive in his church, alive in his man, and Scott says, alive in me. I'm going to quote Scott one more time from that devotion on December 9th. Scott wrote for that devotion, he said, This morning my desire is that we would meet Jesus. That is my desire for us this morning on this December day. One week from celebrating the birth of Christ. My desire is that today we would meet Jesus. See the power of Jesus in our lives. And so today we're going to jump around a little bit. Because here's the thing. When we look at the pages of Scripture, we see Jesus from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. The Bible is our guide. It's our roadmap to finding Jesus, to seeing Jesus, to meeting Jesus, and having him transform us, as we say here all the time, to help us be better today than yesterday, better tomorrow than today, and better is more like Jesus. That's the point. And that's where the power comes from, is meeting Jesus, having him transform our life, and helping us be more like him, more like him tomorrow than we were today, and more like him today than we were yesterday. That's the point. But to be like Jesus, you first have to meet Jesus. You have to find him and see him and meet him. And then most importantly, you have to know him. You have to know him. Jeremiah said this, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. If you look for Jesus wholeheartedly, you will find him. But you have to seek him. And you have to see him. So today, we're going to take a look, kind of an overview of scripture. There's so much scripture I could have used today, but I'm going to pick, we got three different parts. One at the beginning of the book, one about the middle of the book, and one toward the end of the book. And we're going to see that all the way through, we're going to find and see and meet Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and this opportunity we have during this Christmas season to not just focus on your son, but to meet him, to engage with him, to give him the opportunity to transform our lives into something that we never dreamed, transformed our relationships into something we've never imagined, and to help us transform our world into something that we couldn't believe possible. Because that's the power of your son. And so today, Father, I ask that you help all of us open our eyes to see him in a new way, open our hearts to hear your word like we've never heard it before. Open our ears to hear your word, to take it to our hearts, and most importantly, to move it to our feet so that when we leave this place, we are not the same. That we can go out into this world and make a difference for you. And so we thank you for the opportunity we have to dig into your word today. Help us not just be hearers of it, help us do it. In your son's name, amen. Well, here's the thing the Bible itself, the Bible. 
It's a collection of history and poetry and wisdom literature, but it's all brought together by God's divine providence to tell the story. And it tells the story of mankind's creation, mankind's fall, and then mankind's redemption. And through it all, the people in the book, they're looking for a savior because they know they need a savior. They realize they need a savior. And the book talks about so many individuals who are waiting for that savior. And then finally, we get to the savior, his birth, his life, his death. And the end of the book is how we connect with him on a greater level. How do we connect? How do we have that relationship with God through our Savior? So Jesus does not just appear in the Gospels. It's not just a whole bunch of random stuff beforehand about God doing some stuff in people's lives. And then boom, all of a sudden, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there he is for a short time, and now we move on. Everything in Scripture points or foreshadows or is talking about Christ. We meet him in the very beginning of the book. We meet him after the fall. Right after the fall. Look at this. Genesis 4.1. It says, Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. And when she gave birth to Cain, she said, here's a key, With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Now that's kind of a really odd statement. With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Well, that's kind of a idiom. It's, it's a kind of a Hebrew phrase or whatever. And basically, it's kind of her way of thinking. She's thinking, I've done it. I've had my Redeemer. This is the Redeemer. So here's the thing. And when you look back at the garden, Eve was, Adam and Eve were in the garden. We don't know how long they were there with God. We know, you know, seven days of creation, God rested. The question is, it isn't like God rested on Sunday and, or Saturday, Sunday, Sunday God rested on Saturday and then on the following Thursday, Adam took the apple, gave it, Eve took the apple, gave it to Adam. It wasn't an apple, it was fruit. But Eve took the fruit, gave it to Adam, they fell. That was three days later. We have no idea how much time passed from the end of creation until the fall. How long did Adam and Eve spend in the garden? How long were they in paradise? How long did they get to literally walk and talk in a perfect, sinless world face to face with God? I have no idea. I can't imagine that. But it was long enough for Eve to know when they were kicked out what she had lost. And she longed to get that back. And at the end, when, when they fell and God did the curses, Adam, your curses to work. Eve, your curses bearing children, longing for that relationship with your husband. And the serpent's curse, he will bruise basically the Savior's heel Savior will bruise his head. Redemption will come. Eve took that to heart and she thought, okay, great. The next child I have, it's going to start over. So when she had Cain, she thought Cain was the Messiah. She was waiting for him to be that Savior. She wanted to be reconnected with God, reconnected with Adam. She wanted what she had in the garden. We share that same desire. We do. We share that same desire. We try to make heaven on earth, and we try to fill our lives with stuff to make it like heaven on earth. I use this illustration all the time. I talk about our lives being a God-shaped hole. Those of you who've been here for years and years and years, it's amazing. It's like this illustration always comes up. To me, the irony is I always have the picture. And whenever I do it, we don't have donuts here. But yet, whenever I do this illustration, plan the message, I don't say anything, I show up and we've got donuts. If that ain't a God thing, if that ain't a holy God thing, I don't know what is. That was an attempt at a Scott joke. I failed miserably. But our lives are like this donut. We've got all this stuff going on and we try to make it look pretty. I love this. We try to make it look pretty and we try to fill it with colorful things in our life, okay? We try to, we try to bring in relationships and wealth and stuff and finances and trips and, 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 and things. But in the center is a God-shaped hole. And no matter what we put there doesn't work. You try to fill this with a relationship, it's going to leave you empty. You try to fill it with, with the career. You know, you get the job and you think when you get the right job, man, oh, life's going to be great. And then you get that job and a few years in you realize, this ain't it. 
Well, if I could get this house, you buy the house. No, nope, that doesn't do it. If I get this car, this relationship, we have kids. Kids are going to do it for us. <laughs> and you realize there's only one thing you can put in this God-shaped hole in your life that is going to fulfill you and make you complete, and that is the relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. Eve realized that back then. Throughout Scripture, we see individuals that realize that, and they're looking for Jesus. They're seeking Jesus. They're longing for the Messiah. They didn't know his name. We say Jesus because we know it. But they were looking for the Messiah, the one to come to redeem them and mankind. We continue to see that throughout the Old Testament in the Messianic prophecies. That God gave the prophets glimpses and pictures of what it was going to like, what the Messiah would look like, what he would do. Isaiah, wonderful passage, talking about the coming of Messiah. And he's talking about it. He says, for unto us a son is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and his government and its peace will never end. And he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestors, David, for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. And you go through this, like, who is he? Man, we got the description. Who is this Messiah that's going to come and save us? Well, he's a wonderful counselor. Now, some people, some verses put a comma there. And if you go to the original Hebrew, there is no comma there. Wonderful counselor, one phrase, wonderful counselor. Now, that's not just somebody, we think of a counselor as somebody that we got problems and they help us. You know, you, you're having an issue with something and you go to a counselor and they, they talk you through it and give you a solution. But the word counselor here has the idea of a lawyer or an advocate. So basically what Isaiah is here, we have a wonderful counselor. This is the, our advocate. This is a person that stands between us and God. The person that basically when God says, you've sinned, you've messed up, you're not holy, you're not righteous. How can you come into my presence? The penalty for that is death. And we have a wonderful counselor. Uh, he was, Isaiah was looking forward to this Messiah that was going to come and step in and say, no. He is righteous because I'm taking his place. He is righteous because he has trusted me and he loves you. He becomes our counselor between us and God. He himself is mighty God. Everlasting. Prince of peace. These things that we want in our lives. And his government and his peace will never end. And he will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David. Man, isn't that what we want? We want fair rulers. Our political process does not help us very well with that, does it? But we have to remember the people that we put in office. And this is, this is part of it. And I could go through all politicians I can take every president from the current one it's back as far as I can remember and I can talk about their flaws. They're not perfect. They're failures. The things that they've messed up. That's what we point out. You know why? Because see, we're looking for a leader and a ruler who is perfect. That's what's built into us. That's what was built into us at the garden and that's what we long for today. And this verse tells us it's coming but it's not happening until this individual comes, this individual steps up, this individual takes their place on the throne. Because he will rule with fairness and justice. Unlike any politician that we can put in office, I don't care what letters in front of their name. And the passionate commitment of the Lord's heaven armies will make this happen. God, in his timing, will make it happen and it will be for eternity. God's passion for us that led him. This passion led him to the cross on our behalf. Isaiah goes on toward later on in his writing. He says, who has believed our message? And to whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? Talking about the Messiah. He says, he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, beaten so we could be made whole, whipped so we could be healed. And that last one, whipped so he could be healed. Depending, different translations. Some of your translations might say he was scourged. 
for he could be healed. Or his, by his wounds we are healed. Or the most famous King James Version, by his stripes we are healed. He was beaten, tortured, because for us, he took the blood of our punishment for our sins and willingly did it in our place. And then lastly, we meet him in Bethlehem. So we went to the beginning of the book, the middle of the book, now we're to the end. And there's a lot more in between. I could talk about David. I could talk about Abraham, the promises. But all throughout Scripture, the individuals are looking and seeking the Messiah. And then finally, in Bethlehem, we get to meet him. One of our favorite verses at Christmas time. I mean, every Christmas pageant, every show, every play, every reading. Scott read it in the drive through When you pull up to the shepherds, you hear it. Linus' famous speech in the Charlie Brown Christmas special came from Luke 2. It says, there were shepherds biding in their fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. I'm going to go into a keen when I do this. And the angel of the Lord appeared before them, and the glory of the Lord showed all about them, and they were very afraid. And the angel said, fear not, for I bring you good news of great tidings that will be for all the people. For today, born unto you of the city of David is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a child wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And there before the shepherds, the heavenly host appeared. And they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men upon whom his favor rests. Yep, I went into a key mode. That's part of the speech in the innkeeper's dream that I'll be doing Christmas Eve as part of our Christmas Eve service. You don't want to miss that. But I love this speech. I love this account. Because it says it all. Born to you this day in the city of David is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You people and you generations that you've been looking and seeking He is finally here. The Messiah has finally come. The heart of Eve's cry was answered this day in Bethlehem. From the moment Eve fell, this is who she and all of mankind was looking for. Most of them not even realizing it. He was born. The promised one that God had promised us is now revealed. We now restore. We now have the opportunity to meet him. And that's you. We meet him today in you. And people meet him today through you. You're those saying, you may be the only Jesus some people ever see. And that's the truth. Because most people don't pick up the book anymore and read. Most people don't seek him knowingly. They're seeking what he offers. The peace, the love, the relationships, the contentment. But they don't realize that they are seeking Jesus. They've got this God-shaped hole that they're trying to fill everything else, use everything else in their life to fill it, and they can't. Because that's not how it works. And they need someone like you who knows him, who has a relationship with him, to introduce them to him. Because when they are seeking, they are looking. And no many times when somebody is seeking and they're looking after God, God will make a way. And he will provide somebody or something to show them and take them through those next steps. And many times that is you. But so many times we're so involved in our own lives and our own hustle and bustle trying to get through our own day that, man, people come to us and it's like, we miss it. And me as a pastor, I can realize at times that it's like there have been times that all of a sudden something happens. I go, dang it, I missed that one. People meet him today in you. John says this, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave them the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but the birth that comes from God. That's what John was talking about. He talked about being born again. We are born again to the family of God. When you trust Christ, when you accept Christ, that's what happens. You are born into God's family. You have a new family, new father and a new life. And all the promises of God in the book are now yours. If you continue to seek him, follow him, 
study him and try to work to be more like him each day. That's where the power come of Christ comes from. It's from his word and his life and him living in you as you work to be better today than you were today, yesterday, better tomorrow than today, and better is more like Jesus Christ. That is the key. The Greeks, they came to Philip and they said, Sir, we want to meet Jesus I fell with Andrew to double check, make sure what's the schedule. Is it real good? And you know what they did? They took those men to meet Jesus. Challenge for you today is this. Have you met Jesus? Have you met Jesus? But I just meet him. Do you know him? Do you know him? And so many people I talk to, well, yeah, I know Jesus. I've studied Jesus. I've heard about Jesus. But Jesus. Let, me, let, me, let me put it to you a little bit differently. How many of you know who this is? <laughs> Brother Gary Moses, okay? Now, what's funny is when somebody new comes to town, I'll be talking, yeah, Brother, you know, it's an event, this is going, Brother Gary's there, and they would go, okay, I've heard, who the heck is Brother Gary? All right. Pretty much everybody here knows who Gary Moses is. But let me ask you this question Do you know Gary Moses? Because there's a difference. I believe most people know Jesus the way most people in this town know Gary Moses. If you walked up to get, you saw Gary, you know Gary. If you walked up to him, hey Gary, how you doing? You start talking to him. Does he know you? Does he know your name? Does he know your family? Does he ask, does he, does he know to ask questions about you? Or do you just talk and have a conversation? Because see, there's a difference between knowing who Gary Moses is and knowing Gary Moses. I've known Gary for a long time. My dad and him actually taught together at Patty Welder in the late 60s. Actually, Gary started after my dad, and he'll tell a story. My dad actually helped him get his room set up and projector. He was trying to teach something and couldn't get the projector working. And dad helped him, showed him how to work the projector and stuff like that. When I go up to Gary, if I run to Gary at the Healthplex or in an event or somewhere, General's game or something, I walk up, Gary's like, hey, Bard, how are you doing? How's Molly doing? Hey, I haven't seen your mom and dad in a while. How's Ralph and Carol doing? Is, is your mom's leg getting any better? How's your dad's foot? How's, how are his eyes going? See, I know Gary, but Gary knows me. I know Jesus, and if I walked up to Jesus, I know Jesus knows me. That's the question today. How many of you know Jesus the way you know Gary Moses? You know who he is. And if you walked up to him, he'd be friendly and he'd, yeah, but but does he know you? Because you know who he is, but you've never really met him. How many of you know Jesus? But let's be honest, you've never really met him. That's what Christmas is about. Celebrating the one, our Redeemer, the one who was prophesied to come, and to get and give people the opportunity, the chance to meet him and to know him and to get him to the point where they, he knows them. And that's what I want to offer you today. If you've never met Jesus. You know who he is, but you have to think about it. You know what? I know who he is, but I've never really met him. Today is a day I want to give you an opportunity to do that, to go from knowing the historical figure of Jesus to knowing the person of Jesus that we celebrate at the birth that we celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate whose birth we celebrate this time of year. Let me pray. Father, we see through Scripture. You showed us who you were. You showed us who your son is. I think that's what's so important. That Jesus is not just a random individual that we have just kind of lifted up and put on a pedestal. But that your word from Genesis to the Gospels foreshadowed him, told of him, gave more than 300 prophecies about him that there was no way any one person outside of divine intervention 
this, besides a miracle, could meet 300 something prophecies. No other individual has ever been able to fill five of them. And that proves that he is who he said he is. And that he did the things that the book says he did. And you will honor that sacrifice on our behalf if we just call out and accept it. Father, so many of us go through life seeking purpose and seeking meaning, seeking fulfillment. What we don't realize is that we are seeking the relationship with your son, Jesus Christ, and his, all his, his word and salvation offers us. And during Christmas season, so many more people are focused on that. Because it's time of celebration for many, but it's time of hardship for others. Because they start to realize that that God-shaped hole in their life that they've been trying to fill with other stuff is still empty. But today, Father, I want to give anybody here who hasn't had an opportunity, who knows who Jesus is, but has never met him. I want them to have the opportunity today to do that. And simple as introducing yourself to him. Say, Father, I've known who Jesus was historically, but today I know who he is personally. Today, Father, I want to meet Jesus. Let me introduce myself to you. I realize today that I'm a sinner, that I've messed up, that I keep trying to put other things in life in your place. I keep doing the things that I know I shouldn't do and not doing the things that I know I should do. And I realize that those things have kept me away from you. I realize my life has kept me away from you. My focus has kept me away from you. But today, I want to say, here I am. I'm trusting the work that he did on the cross in my behalf. He was born of the virgin, lived a perfect life, went to the cross to take my place so that he could be my wonderful counselor, my mediator between me and you. And because you accepted that sacrifice, he rose on the third day to prove that he was who he said he was. And that you accepted that work on the cross. So I ask him to come into my life, be my savior, and help me live each day for you. <clears throat> For those of us that have known him for a long time, and we know him, and he knows us, Father, I pray for us that this Christmas season we say, here I am, use me. Use this time, this season, to bring people into my life that are seeking Jesus, that are are coming to him basically saying, we want to meet Jesus. We want to meet Jesus. And give us opportunities to make that introduction. We thank you, Father, for your love, your grace in this day. In your son's name.